Very warm welcome to our Grammar Drawing Webinar panel discussion for this evening. My name is William Hernandez. I work for the Gallet AUB, and I hope you will enjoy the show, this slide show, and this, and give you opportunity to see the exhibition over here. And um, just remind you, the, uh, the, the exhibition is going to be open for the public from the 17th of May, following the guideline for the government. And it's only open from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock. Okay, now, uh, this event we're running tonight, just a little for an hour. Um, just please be comfy, just you can have your cup of tea, your tea, and your glass of wine. And I think it's not going to be a fire alarm and power cut this evening, okay? So please just enjoy. <laughs> um, now, um, it's going to be some questions in the chat box as well. So please now, I will pass to Violet McLean. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And I'd like to echo Will's very warm welcome to our webinar this evening. And welcome to all those who are Zooming in from different parts of the world. Uh, I know we have Francis from New York, so a very warm welcome. I'm going to start my sort of address, first of all, with a little bit of history about uh, the university's relationship with the Drawing Prize Touring Exhibition. We've hosted the exhibition now about five times. And I think the first time, Anita, we hosted it was back in 2005. So 16 years ago, we met and you became a friend of the universities. And I don't think we have ever looked back since. And then from 2012, we hosted another four times. And since that, we've been taking it quite regularly. So, um, and the last uh, four times since 2012, we've been working with yourself and Parker Harris. So I'd like to, you know, do a shout out and say a huge thank you to Penny and Emma and their team from Parker Harris, who has managed the tour so successfully and it's been a pleasure to work with them. So thank you for that. And that's our little history. So huge thank you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this exhibition. We currently have the Drawing Prize of 2020, but I know Anita will go in much more detail. So this exhibition includes 71 drawings by 56 participants, including works by students to those uh, of established artists and makers. It has been selected from 4,000 274 pieces of, uh, pieces of work submissions received from across the UK and internationally. So congratulations to the selection panel for going all, through all those. The 2020 exhibition marks the third year of support from the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize by the Trinity Boy Wharf Trust and the 25th consecutive annual open exhibition held since founded in 1994. This exhibition includes drawings by artists, designers, and makers at all stages of their careers, from students to established artists, located across the UK, as well as France, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, and Turkey. The selected works create a diverse exhibition that reflects a, a broad scope of contemporary drawing practice. And we here at the university are delighted to say that three of our colleagues are in this exhibition. Um, uh, a joint piece from um, Simone Grinnell, Sean Bowen, and Dimitri Dyke. So congratulations from us. Um, and congratulations, thank you for selecting them. Um, the exhibition also includes the Working Drawing Prize, which was first launched in 2018. I'm sure Anita, you'll talk a little bit more about that. The tour so far has toured to the Drawing Projects in Turbridge, the Cooper Gallery in Dundee, Trinity Boyf in London, and with its final stop here, uh, the gallery in Bournemouth, so thank you. And it just shows that we won't let coronavirus stop us from trapping art. Um, and also there's a fully illustrated publication with the tour. So please bear that in mind to all those who've logged on, you can purchase the catalog. I just wanna let, mention a little bit about drawing here at the university. Drawing is positioned, as we know, at the heart of contemporary creative practice. And it is taught at AUB uh, as an extension of thinking. Throughout our lives, we all make marks of one kind or another. Our drawing is, is is an essential and fundamental form of need, our need to communicate. At AUB, we celebrate its diversity. We are so committed to drawing. Uh, it saw us commission the first, um, uh, it saw us commission the Crab Drawing stu Studio, which opened in March 2016, which was designed by Professor Sir Peter Cook, um, who's also an alumnus and an honorary fellow of the university. It was the first of its kind in the UK in over 100 years. So I hope that shows our commitment to drawing. And we were very fortunate to have the famous Dame Zaha Adid 
who opened the building by simply saying, I love this building. And unfortunately, this was her last formal engagement before she passed away in 2016. We, we thoroughly enjoy having this exhibition. Uh, Anita, you give us a fantastic opportunity to show incredible work and you do all the hard work by inviting such a, a fantastic panel to curate this selection. We have the joy of exhibiting it. So we're delighted to have the exhibition again. Now let me introduce you to our chair this evening, um, Professor Paul Goff, our principal and vice chancellor here from the university. Um, Paul is not only our vice chancellor, he is a painter, a broadcaster and writer. He has exhibited, exhibited globally and has represented a number of international collections. Paul has published widely in art history, cultural studies, and has written nine books on imagery of war, peace, remembrance, and um, commemoration. And he is currently working on his second book on Banksy. So it gives me great pleasure to call upon Professor Paul Goff, our chair this evening, to take over. So, Professor. Thank you very much, Will and Violet. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, very briefly uh, introduce the wonderful panel we have in front of us from my lockdown temporary studio here in uh, Bournemouth. Uh, and joining us we have from Dundee, uh, Anita Taylor, an artist, curator and educator, founding director of this remarkable drawing prize since 1994 and established drawing projects in the UK in 2009. We all know that Anita has extensive leadership, teaching, research, review experience in higher education in the UK and globally, and has exhibited internationally as well, winning many prizes, awards, and is currently the Dean of Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. We have M. Lorem joining us from Tenerife, an artist and first prize winner at this prize in 2020. Studied BA Fine Art at Universidad de La Laguna, then an MA Fine Art at Central St. Martins, and is currently studying for a PhD. Exhibited globally in solo and group exhibitions in Spain, Portugal, Japan, and the Tate Exchange in London. 2018 was finalist for Signature Art Prize 2020, and that year was also shortlisted for Zeller Stories performance. And joining us from New York, Francis Morris, director of Tate Modern since 2016, a curator, writer, and broadcaster. Francis joined Tate in 1987, becoming head of displays in 2000, and Director of Collections International Art from 2006, has led the transformation of Tate's international collection, strategically broadening and diversifying its international reach and representation, and also developed the collecting of live art and performance. And from the other side of Dorset, joining us Ian McKeever, as an artist has also exhibited globally a huge list of global shows from Stockholm in 1985, Barcelona in 96, Beijing 2005, Tate Britain 2011, National Museum of Norway 2012, and numerous solo exhibitions. His work is represented in numerous public collections too, the Tate, British Museum, Royal Academy of Arts in London, major collections in Vienna, Budapest, Louisiana, Copenhagen, Helsinki, New York, and Boston. And in 2003, Ian was appointed a Royal Academician, but a year before that, he became a much celebrated honorary fellow of this wonderful university at AUB, and exhibited here in 2004. So welcome to you all. Can't thank you enough for setting aside so much time and, uh, and generosity of spirit. I'm sure it's going to be there. I'm going to turn really first. We have lots of questions coming in and I have a few pre-prepared ones as one does. But Anita, a little bit of history of this wonderful competition and, and where it came from, what it's doing and where it goes next. Um, well, the history of the project, as we call it, the Open Exhibition, uh, is that it began um, in Cheltenham, uh, where I was head of painting, and we were teaching um, a systematic course about the systems of drawing as an introduction to students studying in painting and more broadly in art and design. And in the 1990s, it will seem quite difficult for many people in the audience to think this, it was actually quite difficult to see drawings. Um, and we were teaching students about drawing and about the vitality of drawing in the present and actually finding it very difficult to give them really great examples um, to see. Of course, there are major collections, um, but, but this was part of the challenge that we had was how did we ensure that students um, could see drawing, could see that artists use drawing as a creative part of their practice and that it was a vital part of that. 
Um, we had the opportunity to take on the Open Drawing exhibition that had been started uh, by a group called the Malvern Drawing Associates, who had a commitment to the idea of establishing something also in the regions. Um, but that was a, a, a small part of it. And we took it on and redevised it with the students. And so it had a two part thing. One was to find out who was drawing, what they called drawing, what we thought was drawing and, and where they were and what that meant in all its vitality. But the other was to redevise or reframe the open submission and for our students to understand what an open exhibition was from the inside out. Um, so we actually redevised it with our students um, in the first instance, and obviously it's gone through various iterations since, but it began in an art school uh, and it began uh, with the premise that our artists would kind of frame uh, this process with, and to really understand, recalibrate our experiences of the open exhibition, because clearly once you leave institutions, it's quite difficult to gain the opportunities of excellence people you value seeing the work. So its framework is an open exhibition. It doesn't have any criteria other than if you think it's a drawing, you can present it to a panel who are really interested in drawing, who will have a dialogue about whether it is a drawing, whether it's a good drawing and whether it's a drawing they want, want to support enough uh, to reflect often the status of drawing today um, to have in an exhibition that tours. And it's an annual touring exhibition um, 2020 is the 25th consecutive exhibition. It's actually the 26th in total. Um, I've been there from the beginning and my role is really to put together the panels, raise the funding, ensure that the process operates fairly and equitably and does all the things that it, it does and to promote um, drawing in all its breadth and to promote a dialogue about drawing. And the role that it's played, I think, has really been to provide a resource uh, both an opportunity for artists and makers of drawings, because they don't have to be artists to make drawings. Drawing has a, a wide brief. Um, and to, so creating the opportunity, creating the opportunity for that work to be seen uh, and creating opportunities that ripple through an open exhibition. So uh, we present work to collectors as well as, uh, you know, so we talk about drawing, it's about the systems, the grammar, if you like the role that drawing plays in practice today, um, but it's also about sharing a rounded view of the open exhibition. So you'll see if you look at the publication or visit the show, there are um, essays by the selectors, the contextual piece by me, there are uh, images of all the works and we ask all of the people included in the show to make a statement about the drawing they've made so that we can think about the role that that drawing has played for them uh, as well. So it's right. really about putting uh, the apparatus around that and touring it. Um, I don't Wonderful. know what I can say. Over yep. the years, we've worked, if I can say one thing, we've worked with different uh, funders. So we had 17 years of funding from Jerwood. So not the, we had seven years of other funding before that. And they brought a frame of reference, which was the UK, because they fund and support projects that benefit the UK. And that meant we created a field uh, if you like, of inquiry around the UK. Our new funder doesn't have that um, constraint. So last, this year we opened the exhibition back up as it had been originally conceived for an international submission. But our new funder, Trinity Boy Wharf, also has a huge passion for drawing and we have a new inquiry within this, which is the Working Drawing Award, uh, which has a separate panel. It was selected by Sir Ian Blatchford, Piers Goff and Sophie McKinney from v &A Dundee this year which looks at the role of drawing um, in order to propose, develop ideas for something that can be made. Thank you, Anita. It's very comprehensive and uh, it's a formidable achievement over 25, 26 years. So we'll touch on that perhaps when I come to Francis so again about what's been learned over this 25, 26 years about the nature of drawing that you've seen uh, and the panorama that you've experienced there. But I'll go to M because really I'm interested. Uh, you're a prize winner. Uh, you have tremendous kind of um, uh, engagement with this, this, uh, this activity, this competition. What does it mean for artists to enter competitions, to be selected, to win prizes? How important is that the ecosystem of support for artists? Well I think open exhibitions play, play a really important role in building an art career and they give you a lot of visibility and it's a very good opportunity to test your work and um, 
have it shown out there in front of a huge uh, audience, right? So for me, the whole experience has been really amazing. Just the opportunity to have my work seen by this distinguished uh, selection panel and shortlisted for the exhibition was already really rewarding. Um, but also having my work shown, shown uh, across the UK uh, along with so many talented artists and in these uh, really professional exhibitions uh, has been really amazing. And especially during these uncertain and strange times in which mostly everything is uh, running virtually, right? And also in terms of winning the prize, uh, I think, well, I think, no, this is definitely the most significant uh, milestone in my, in my art career so far. And uh, it has uh, helped me gain a lot of visibility, both on the internet and on the real life as well. I have been featured in, Insta in many Instagram accounts, in magazines, in new on newspapers, on even some TV programs as well. And also uh, the financial reward has uh, helped me tackle other projects that I couldn't uh, afford before because they required of a more uh, complicated logistics. And I have also been able to get more materials to carry on my research and to equip my studio much better. So I feel super proud to have been uh, to have won this prize and super thankful for it. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank again Anita and all the Trinity Boy Wars Drawing Prize team for their fantastic work in the, in doing these amazing exhibitions and all the uh, parallel events that they organize these uh, talks and discussion with the artists. And of course to the selection panel to have uh, noticed my work and to have trust in it. And um, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you to all very much. And um, that's, that's as it has meant a world for me, really. So thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, there's a question coming from Carolyn, Carolyn Black here, which will touch on some of that, which is because there's a strong performative element, obviously, in your, your wonderful piece of work. And, and what has the, the pandemic meant for those of us who visit or can't visit or have to go virtually into galleries? But we'll come on to that presently. And who better to kind of take us into some of that, Francis, but a reflection from you about what drawing competitions such as this show us about the not just the history, but the evolution of drawing over a period of time. And how much do they matter in terms of feeding into that uh, that museum and galleries uh, ecosystem? Very good questions, Paul. I and mean, I think one of the interesting aspects from my point of view of a, a drawing prize like this, is touches on uh, Anita's, this is an open prize. Uh, and uh, that's very important because it, it and, and it's very important that occasionally somebody like me is able to be on the selection panel. So they get to see not just the works that are selected and dare I say beautifully installed uh, in, in the small uh, film we just saw as, as indeed they were in London uh, where I, was, I have, was fortunate enough to see the installation in, in the flesh. But you also get a cross section of what a kind of generation defines as drawing in their own practice. And, um, you know, I'm at a, what I think is interesting, and in, when you look at the arc of certainly the time I've been a curator, so whether it's this prize or other prizes or seeing uh, graduate degree shows, is a kind of uh, relentless, and I, but I mean that in a positive way, expansion of the language of drawing. And what was so clear to us as selectors, I think, about this time, I don't think we threw out any work because we didn't think it was a drawing. So the open was, it was an open submission, but we were very open in response and very elastic in, in, in our, our approach to the kind of practice. And one of the notable things about the work that has ended up in the selection is that the vast majority of, there are, of course, there's some drawings that do speak to a kind of um, particular type of practice with a history. And I know you're going to come on to talking about the grammar of drawing, that you can see uh, learnt skills, methodologies of composition, um, traditional techniques, et cetera, et cetera. And all that is brilliantly um, manifest in the selected exemplars. But for the most part, works that we selected intersected with other types of practice. 
So whether they were uh, artists that could, works that artists could also positioned as paintings or as collage or as sculptures or as um, uh, moving image works or indeed in Madeline's case as performance or particip participatory practice. And I think that is highly indicative of the way that artists have been personally very instrumental in challenging the kind of boundaries of media, but also boundaries of geography, uh, boundaries of time, boundaries as I identify that have perhaps artificially separated um, different practices off in relation to kind of art history and the canon. And all that I think is very helpful because it, it is, it seems to demonstrate to me that this year more than any other, what you're seeing is an unbelievably healthy ecosystem of arts practice in drawing at a time during which we were living through the most unhealthy <laughs> uh, era of, of, of our lifetime with a pandemic. So that was the other thing, distinctive thing about open selection, open practice at a time when society was really closed down. So we all remarked when we were looking at the um, submissions on how often the drawings in many different formats and, uh, and, and media with it and techniques were addressing content that had to do with uh, isolation, the solitary, the family, uh, repetitive practice, you know, all, all those sort of things. So I really do think in the history of this drawing prize, this year is going to be seen as an astonishing benchmark to encapsulate this moment. And I just finally want to say something before we move on. Obviously, there are lots and lots of things to talk about. The, the, we selected two, with Madeleine and Nancy Haslam Chance, really powerful statements that seem to us to stand like as, um, you know, book benchmarks to uh, frame this incredibly expansive experience. You know, the huge collective participatory of, of Madeline's work, and then these tiny, intimate, almost amateur drawings of Nancy's, which spoke so personally of a kind of intimacy. And, um, I think that's what we felt about a great, great works, but also very symbolic of this open practice that, that the whole uh, exhibition demonstrates. Thank you so much, Francis. And I'll come to you in a second, but just picking up that theme that both Madeline and Anissa talked about, and, and certainly some of the commentators here, Isabel Parker, David Barron, speaking around has, and it's a question we'll come back to because I'll go on to the grammar in a second, but has drawing lost its essential frames of reference in that in its expanded field, it has become everything and anything. But hold that there, because I don't know the answer and you must all know that one. Um, and I'll come to Ian, because Ian, you and I were talking just before about a, 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 a Murray Claire Foer wrote in, quoting extensively from Karl Plackman's work around, this is the definition, both one in 1972 and one much more recently. They're rather good, actually, and they're rather long. I'm not going to read them out, but they are about what drawing is and what it, what it, what it can be. But what's, um, what's your sense of uh, the grammar as an accepted lexicon? Does that mean uh, it is finite, infinite? Um, and if you've got a grammar, does that mean it only equips you to say something else? through painting, drawing, performance, or whatever? Uh, perhaps, uh, I mean, uh, drawing goes, predates the written word in uh, areas like that. If you think of hieroglyphs or pictograms, then uh, they predate uh, the written word. So it's a very early form of uh, communication of actually beginning to structure language. Uh, I think if you think of the written word as becoming the specificness of our understanding of language, the tightness of language, mm. then drawing to some extent is the antithesis of that. It's very, very leaky. It's very, very open. And it's actually that leakiness, that openness that uh, draws us to it. it, it it's permeable. It's ever-changing. It doesn't have parameters in that sense. Mm. Uh, and I think that's what makes drawing so interesting is the, is the total uh, irreverence that somehow it has for the norms of what we might call structuring language. Mm. It's also curious, I think, in that it, unlike, say, painting or sculpture, it holds a kind of intimacy. Mm. Uh, it doesn't reveal itself in the same way that they do. They, both painting and sculpture, have a kind of public face to them, for want of a better expression. 
Well, so I think drawing sort of holds off. I always think when I look at drawings that it's like listening to, uh, to, to conversations you're not a part of, but you can sort of hear it in the background noise, you know, and you're picking up bits of it. So you're getting the drift of where the conversation's going, but actually not getting the whole thing. And I tend to think that drawings work in the same kind of way. They have this kind of hidden secretness to them, whereby you're only partly, partly party to it. And that only partly party to it is infinitely fascinating because it sort of pulls you in. It pulls you in endlessly, time after time. Uh, and I think the, the very, very wide parameters of drawing, and they are getting wider and wider and wider, are in its favor. I, I think it, 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 you know, it, it can just keep leaking new possibilities, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it's a great way of expressing it. And uh, there's some common terminology being used here, which is so uh, exciting. Um, and it takes me to one of the questions we've had from, you've already covered it to a degree, from, from Howard Riley around a visual C preceding literacy and numeracy. Certainly we are seeing this in the exhibitions and the richness of the exhibitions that, uh, that, that you've been able to host, Anita. But tell me a little bit, you've been able to look back uh, with your great wisdom of 25 years worth of um, the, the drawing shows, What's changed and what hasn't? Because in a sense, what Madeline and Francis and Ian is pointing to is there's consistency, continuity, adaptability, but also there's some key elements that we're hearing here. Uh, intimacy is one of them, uh, a sort of um, uh, a leakiness in terms of the way the language is developed. What's, what have you seen over the 25 years? I dare ask such, such a massive question. That's a huge question. Um, I mean, what we've seen is a confidence in drawing and a confidence that this language way of making, way of expressing um, is really of value. Um, I will say that each year has a different sensibility and this year I think has, mm. uh, as Francis has referred to, a very specific sensibility. And I think, you know, the sense of drawing being, uh, you know, life affirming and connected in terms of both expression and communication this year has been really critical, but it does that through all of its forms and the sense of the diaristic, the expressive, the documentary. Um, it does that both through performance, film, all sorts of means of making drawing, thinking. I mean, um, Anita, but, Anita, could I ask you a question? Because obviously you've been completely immersed in this. One of the things that I thought was very interesting was the uh, strong number of probably amateur drawers who had submitted work. And of course, drawing emerged as a kind of amateur, strong amateur art form in the 16th century, and possibly kind of then was overtaken by photography, which was also another hugely popular uh, uh, manifestation of creativity. But there was, there seemed to be a lot of drawings uh, submitted that were ex very, very um, highly skilled, but possibly self-taught photographic renditions. And I just wondered whether you thought that was something that was indicative of this year or whether you've seen emerging over time, this very strong, confident amateur community, which I loved. Yeah, no, I think it's really, I think it's increased. And I think this year we saw more of it. Uh, and I think that's partly to do with what happened in lockdown as people found a way. There's a lot of provisional materials in, mm. in exhibition this year it's not just a sense of intimate drawing that that talks spontaneously to to making a a, a, a communication an expression whatever it is um, but i think that's something that has increased um over time and i think the photo the reference to photography is something that ebbs and flows and there was a lot more of it i think in yeah. 2018 so those things ebb and flow and they they reflect different things uh, I think this year, the kind of journalistic, if you like, I mean, and I mean that in diaristic uh, frame of reference, um, I'm working on very provisional materials, you know, cardboard, the things that came through your door this year mm. were the things that people were using inventively to uh, as surfaces, uh, to construct things. So I think there was a, a growth in that this year. I think it will be really interesting to see whether that helps again. Um, going forward, but it's partly the scale of submission of the company. Um, I think also a reference to, you know, there was a greater deal of figuration in the professional art world as well. And mm -hmm. So sure. there's also a, an ebb and flow that reflects 
um, those dialogues as well. Uh, so that's that's great, um, Madeline. Do you feel that um, the the the, the f- performative element that's in your work uh, is is we were expecting to see more? I mean, we. Uh, I, I remember 20 years ago looking at exhibitions and the idea that one would actually take part in something, feel a, a dialogic relationship to the end, the, the, the continuing, not just the end product. What's some, what have you seen in your time over the last few years in terms of that way of interacting with art and drawing? Um, well, for my research, I'm trying to uh, track where is it coming from? And obviously there are uh, a lot of precedents, especially in 20th century. But I'm actually looking uh, way back uh, from that. I'm actually looking into the cave paintings, for example, which I think, which I think are the first uh, manifestation of something similar to, to performative drawing, right? But uh, obviously there are so many precedents in the 20th century, like, I don't know, Jackson Pollock or Yves Klein or Calori Shineman, there's a lot of people, but especially in the 21st century, uh, there's quite a lot of people working around this idea of uh, mixing performance and, and drawing. Uh, the, the, there seems to be an interest over the last decades of working around uh, this practice. And especially in the UK, um, it looks to me that there is like a strong community coming into, into form, right? Mm. This. Mm. So, and uh, do you mean in particular about participation of, mm. yeah, of the audience? That aspect. Well, mm, you will be very surprised, but the participatory aspect is not something that I'm including in my theoretical research for my PhD at the moment, because, you know, there are so many elements uh, that need to take into consideration uh, within this and participatory practices it's just a part of it but it's not like uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, such an important concept uh, as uh, for example body or trace or uh, drawing as process itself so unfortunately I, ne- I needed to leave that out for now <laughs> but maybe well not maybe but probably I will uh, take that topic later on for a postdoc or something like that. Great, thank you. We've got an interesting question coming in, uh, Ian. I'm not going to pose this one directly at you, but many of you may want to think about it. It's from Helena McGrath around um, that life drawing was often considered the core skill for for artists, and now it's about um, the discursive, the ability to contextualise a talk around and about one's work. We've had plenty of examples of that thus far, so we may come back to that one, um, and you can either agree or disagree, or we can talk about it. But Ian, I was going to just pick up on um, on your own practice at the moment. Uh, and, and what, what, how you've seen this, this, uh, these exhibitions? Well, I remember them, you know, under the Gerber days, and now under this extraordinary kind of uh, patronage that Anita and colleagues have put together. Was well, there anything in this current show that you thought, hmm, there is, we've seen none of this, or, or there are some absences in the in the the grammar of drawing over the last few years? Is there anything gone? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, the exhibition covered everything. Uh, everything in Gambit from incredibly articulate, uh, realistic drawings, I mean, some of them quite extraordinary uh, mm-hmm. in accomplishment, to, uh, to works which are very conceptual. And uh, uh, it's, I think it's just a, a, a greater broadening as, as time goes on. Uh, it, there, is, there seems to be a kind of dichotomy in, in here somewhere to do with how for some people, drawing is the is the is the kind of rendering of something true. So you're you're trying to accomplish a, a chair looking like a chair or a person looking like a person, and then for someone else, it's like they want to throw that out of the window and and they want to actually find drawing or find uh, what they want to say through uh, deconstructing drawing. And uh, these two things just rub endlessly against each other. Mm. Uh, and it's it's part of the dynamic of what drawing is is that is that uh, is that every time uh, they rub against each other, friction's created and something else comes up. And uh, you know it, it it gives a kind of heat. It gives a kind of energy. Mm-hmm. And it is just extraordinary how people can uh, keep uh, keep kindling that, can keep actually finding some kind of fire in that tension. Mm. which they do it, it just you know i think back to the when i think of uh uh 
uh, M's uh, work, uh, you know, it takes me back to the 70s to, uh, to conceptualism and to the predominance of process-led art. You know, some of the Germans, the Klaus Rinkers and the friends who had Walters who were actually doing performative pieces, which to a large extent had a, often a drawing component in them. So, you know, and yet this is something that has slipped out of our vocabulary in the last 30 or, 30 or 40 years, you know, and uh, it's being rethought yet again in the, in the 21st century. So I think it's, you know, it, 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 this is what art does. It keeps reinventing itself, which is extraordinary. Yeah, very true. Uh, I remember being taught by um, uh, drawing tutors uh, and uh, the whole thing that when you draw, does, do, do you, are you talking in your head as you're making the drawing? Is it running through your head? Or is everything going on in there as well as in the hand? And there's a question here, and we'll come back to this, Francis, around the discursive nature of the drawn act. But I'm fascinated by Kira's, uh, Kira Tool has asked, is there a, draw, a division we're hearing between drawing is thinking and drawing as experience? Uh, one being kind of uh, this conceptual process, the other one as a kind of haptic or, or pragmatic one. Um, and you might want to touch on that. And also just reflection on the drawing as process that we saw, the drawing in progress aspect of the show, which I think is really fascinating because it's getting inside um, the doing, the making. But can you pick up that thought there around drawing as thinking and drawing as experience? Again, I think it's, I think it's difficult to talk... Uh, uh, about drawing as if it's a kind of, you know, a single thing. Mm. But, I, but, I, but, but I do, obviously there are, uh, in all making activities, and indeed all play activities, there is, are strong connections between process um, and idea generation. And I'd cognit I don't know what's going on cognitively but, but to draw is a, um, a deeply creative act, mm -hmm. however creative you are, and, and it, it, things come out of it. And um, so I don't think people think then draw, or draw then think, and whatever kind of drawing is taking place, it is creating a, a cognitive response that manifests itself in thought. Mm -hmm. But there again, dare I say it, so does bicycling. <laughs> you know, or I think about Agnes Martin, who's one of the most wonderful graphic artists of all times. And her most productive mode of behavior was to sit in a rocking chair. Yeah. And she sat in a rocking chair and ideas came to her. If she didn't sit in a rocking chair, ideas didn't come to her. So, you know, I, I think it, uh, if drawing can be, uh, it, you can take a line for a walk. You can you can take drugs and be Henri Michaud, and the ideas come. You can be a surrealist and dive into your conscious. But there's there is a connection between the activity, the process, the medium, and the idea generation. But you'd need to be a psychologist really to even begin to understand that. Of which I'm not. So can I, can I can I add yeah. something to that because I'm actually very interested in that particularly, and this 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 is indeed one of the things that I'm researching. For my for my PhD, because obviously I'm very much interested in drawing as process, because of my practice, and in this regard, uh, I'm very uh, I'm getting very interested in Jean-Luc Nancy's ideas about drawing, because he speaks about drawing as the birth of forms, as the opening of forms, and as a formative force. So draw, drawing as the means by which uh, ideas and forms acquire uh, emerge and acquire presence and sense. And it is, of course, uh, uh, a very valuable tool to apprehend the world, but also our thoughts and, and ideas, no matter if you are drawing figuratively or you are doing, uh, drawing abstract. But uh, thoughts, uh, I don't think they happen separately to the body, but they go through the body. So, yep. yeah. <laughs> There's a question here, Em. Um, there's a number of really fascinating questions emerging. We're never going to get time to cover them, but I might well cut and paste them and then think about how these could inform a really interesting research paper, Anita. Um, but it's from Anne and Christopher. Good to see you there. Um, do your drawings, Em, do they have a finite end in time? Well, it depends on each work, basically. Like, I leave the, I leave the process and my body tell me, or even the drawing itself as an object, to let me know when it, it needs to be finished. 
So it depends. Some, de some of them, uh, the performance lasts for five minutes, some of them for 40 minutes. So it really depends on any case. Obviously, in the participative ones, as there are many people getting involved, we need of a longer time than so, when I'm on my you. own. But, yeah. so I'm going to ask Anita and, and Ian this question, which could be for not just for drawing, but I suppose I know when my, one of my drawings or painting, one of my drawings is finished because it's not getting any worse. But um, Ian, when, is, when, when do you know your drawings are done? And Anita, the same. And you're both phenomenal drafts people. Well, just, your work is extraordinary. I'm, I'm a great believer in it. Sounds, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Franz Klein was one that once asked, when is a painting finished? And uh, he said, well, the question actually isn't how do you finish a painting, the question is how do you start a painting? <laughs> and for me, the same thing applies to the drawing process, that somehow implicit in the first act and the, and the conception of actually making a drawing is, the res, is its resolution. It's as if it actually flows through naturally. So uh, for me, the, the completion of work isn't some kind of artifice that I stick onto it at the end or some determinant factor that I stick onto it. It, it is actually a, a, a consequence of, a, of the drawing just finishing itself. Hmm. Uh, and that's it. You know, you, you, it, it, as Francis says, you're taking a line for a walk if you're working with a line and uh, it knows when to stop walking. <laughs> <laughs> You me when it falls over. No, I would echo that. It's when the dialogue falls over. Say that again, Anita. I would say it's when the dialogue is over. I mean, and sometimes you pick a drawing up five years later. And mm. whatever, but, it, but it is actually about, the, for me, drawing is where I see what I'm thinking and where I'm having the dialogue mm. about the whole experience of being that I'm exploring. So... That might be a continuum and it might be something very instant. It really depends um, on the quality of that experience. So I think it's both thinking and experience if you want to go back to the earlier question as well within that. Um, but it, it's when does the full stop come for you? Mm. To keep going with the conversation with yourself through the drawing. Mm, that's so well, well said. I think uh, they're really insightful uh, when it stops talking to you and it becomes mute when you realize that the, the dialogue is no longer a dialogue. It's a monologue as much as anything. That's one of the worst things can happen. The other thing I always enjoy about looking at the exhibition and going through this is, for, for any of us who are practitioners, is how many good ideas you can take from it. And that's what the students I see at the university at AUB are thinking, well, I'm going to try a bit of that. Or oh, if I did this and did that. And I guess in these pandemic days, and it was mentioned earlier on by, by Carolyn Black, that we've lost something in terms of the haptic, the seeing, the close-up arrows on virtual tours you must have faced this at the tate francis how how have you managed to we can sustain audiences virtually for so long but there comes a moment when it, it stops working what are you doing at the tate next in terms of making sure that people can both have a digital experience but know that it's it's the stuff that really matters well we're opening the doors that's what we're doing on the 17th of may thank goodness I mean, there is a limit to the, this is a pleasure, I have to say, but there are, is a limit to the number of Zoom conversations one wants to have under lockdown. But I, I, and one of the, actually one, over the summer, we do have a project which will involve drawing and will involve play and will involve any child or family who comes to the institution. And I think that's what we're trying to do when we reopen is actually engage audiences in the making thing. And I, that's why I'm very, very passionate about the, 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 vol, the, the numbers of amateur drawings of people starting out in their, uh, their homes who submitted. Because I think it's just, it, the more people who can get involved in making, the more vibrant a culture we will have and the greater uh, the art of the future. You know, it's just like, this is why football is so great in the UK, isn't it? Because all kids are little kickers. Let's have all children as little drawers get them out there. So I think, I think that's, that's one of the big lessons for me of COVID is the power of making, not just for the privileged museum elite of artists, but for everybody. We need to recenter that in people's lives. I'm so excited to hear you talking in terms of, of, of drawing and the fine arts being, you've used analogies coming from football and from bicycling <laughs> and from gardening. It's terrific, the world of metaphor. <laughs> I'm sorry to hold this with you, Francis. What are you seeing in New York in terms of, let's say, drawing? Maybe you haven't had a chance to see very much that you think this has got to be 
the global, this has got to be in the UK, this has got to be in the Tate. Are you seeing very much over there? Uh, I haven't seen anything there yet because I've only been here for 24 hours. <laughs> I'm quarantining. But I'm I'm, I, actually, what I'm, I am interested in seeing how institutions are open, are open uh, to a socially uh, distanced audience. So that's a really important um, uh, learning. You know, it's, a, it's an, uh, uh, something that I can benefit from and, and we can learn from going forwards. Yep. Thank you. There's a couple of questions coming in here around um, uh, both... It, could the video of your work, M, be productive? Could that be the end point? And the same for Ian and Anita. Have you ever been um, filmed or recorded while you're drawing? And how vulnerable does that make you in terms of the process being outed? It makes you perform, which is, <laughs> which is slightly artificial in that, in that I, I try to avoid being caught filmed in the, in the worky process simply because one becomes too self-conscious and uh, I mean, the whole idea of being in the studio is that there's no one else there and having someone filming there is, a, is a, a, you know, a, it's just too much. But they are, Ian, those historic films of Jackson Pollock or Carol Apple yes. or Yayu Kusama, they are just so astonishing and revelatory to see an artist practice well, in this. Yeah, they, they are, but they are kind of, uh, how can I phrase this? They, they occupy a specific position in, in yes. that the, they're all carrying out acts, which if you like are kind of cliches of what they do. You know, Pollock is spreading paint. Whether or not that painting actually ever became a painting or not, we don't know. Uh, I mean, I watched a film uh, the other night, an interview with Philip Guston, in which he was working on one of the later paintings, and it was being filmed as he did it. And, uh, you know, sure enough, the next day, he scraped it all off and started all over again. And we never <laughs> knew what he subsequently painted. So, uh, you know, it, it's... it's uh, it's a very, very tricky area. So some actions, so to speak, that the artists make or performative elements that they make lends itself to this kind of theater of presentation. And they are very powerful, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but whether or not we actually need to know, I don't even think we need to know what's going on in the artist studio in that sense. I think that, I think this is, this is a whole other territory, but I think it's a very interesting area of to what extent the artist studio is increasingly becoming a public domain. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it's quite problematic uh, in that it, it demystifies the whole art making process when I would have thought the whole point of it is to make it as mystifying as possible. No. Thank you, Ian. Um, we probably are going off the tack, but I still think it's a great conversation. Anita, um, and then to M, uh, Anita, in terms of rec being recorded in the process of making these extraordinary portraits and figure drawings that you do, and then, and then going on to M for that conversation, could it have been just video rather than the drawing? Anita? Um, for me, I have been filmed drawing, but I know it's not uh, the same as drawing without anybody watching. Um, so I think, and, and I think that is about transition into a different arena. I mean, documentation and I think actually revealing process yeah. is actually important. Um, and I think one of the things that we work quite hard to do, and I'm quite committed to, is how do we reveal process? Because the thing that you do in art school, the thing I think we've lost in pandemic distance learning is actually that learning from each other and how the know-how of drawing, and I think that is one of the great things about this exhibition. Yeah. In all that every year is about know how of drawing and how people are constructing things and making those relationships. But so, yes, I'm committed to the idea that it might be a good thing because it's not necessarily an authentic no. uh, experience um, in the terms of the kind of work that I make. Thank you. There is a kind of vulnerability about showing drawings. I feel very much like that. It's, it's about reading out your poetry. Um, and M. <laughs> In terms of that, there's a very interesting question there from Richard, Richard Waring, who's a head of fine art at AUB, and I'll read it. I wondered if M considered showing a video of the dynamic, I've lost it now, a video of the dynamic performance, performative actions, instead of or as well as the final drawing. Does that make well, yes, yeah, well, it depends on the case. Like, actually, because of my practice is interdisciplinary, it has like uh, different faces that can potentially work. Of course, we do live performances. I do them, or I arrange a setting for people to do a live performance. 
But also, for example, when we made You Are It back in 2019 in Tenerife Espacio de las Artes, we made the performance prior to the exhibition period. And then what, why, what I decided to exhibit was the final drawing as long as the, uh, along with the video of its making. But then for the Trinity Boy Wars drawing prize, I applied only with the video as a moving image work because I thought it was working, it was working in itself as a video. And also in some occasions, I have decided to show only the final result of the drawing, even uh, without the video or without uh, people seeing me doing the drawing, because another thing I'm interest, I find interesting is um, I wonder to what extent people can kind of uh, read my performance on the drawing, you know, like kind of imagine the performance instead of witnessing the performance. Mm. So it really depends on every case, I think. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Can you believe it? The hour is nearly over and um, I'm going to go to a, a, a rap from Anita. There are so many good questions in the chat there that I'm going to ask Violet and Will, who are doing a great job hosting this, to capture some of those, not least because uh, they are so leading and so interesting and there's so much respect for the conversation, the dialogue, and for the insights that you brought to bear on this. So thank you so much. But Anita, final word from you, and then I'll wrap, and then we'll hit the six o'clock button. Uh, in terms of the final word, I think that, that we entice people here with a conversation about the grammar of drawing, and I think that's embedded and embodied through the exhibition. Uh, we see all the works um, just as visual media, so visual drawing, so we don't have all the other stuff around it. So just to park that, the other thing to say is, of course, the call for entries for 2021 is open. Um, and this year we have the additional award of the Evelyn Williams Award, which is to support a, a, a mid-career artist to have a solo show at Hastings Contemporary. And the first time we ran that was in 2017, which Barbara Walker was awarded the award and, and presented Vanishing Point at Hastings Contemporary then with Gallery. Um, so really, the call for entry is open. If you want to find out more about the exhibition project and enter into the dialogue, there is a, speci a special website for the Trinity Boy Wolf Drawing Prize as part of Drawing Projects UK. It has some of the history. It will be enhanced. But we're also running alongside all of these discussions at AUB. We've run a lot of discussions and dialogues about these topics. And what I will do is take away some of the questions and the discussion events we'll put on um, to support alongside the exhibition, I think we'll address some of these questions because I can see them turning away in people's minds and they're really important ones to address. So Thank I'd you. like to say how wonderful it is to be back at AUB. Um, it does matter to us to show the drawing show in an educational context as well as in public context. We've been really lucky this year. The only showing that couldn't open to the public was in London. Um, so it actually has been open and we were lucky to make M. Lurham's drawing in Dundee. And of course, that took place over six weeks when the show was on. So I'd like to thank all of the artists, all of the submitters, all of the selectors and everyone for supporting this project. It's been, you know, is always a fantastically humbling experience to see all of those drawings and to work with people with a real commitment, as you've heard this evening, to thinking about drawing and its importance and continuing relevance to everybody um, in society. So thank you. Anita, bravo to you for not just saying those wonderful words, but for hosting this uh, exhibition and for staying with it for so long and making it such, uh, you know, a totem in the, in the world of drawing uh, internationally. Um, if you were to see the exhibition at AUB, out of one's eye over on the far side is, is Sir Peter Cook's Crab Studio, the drawing studio. And next month we actually open up a new building by Sir Peter Cook, an innovation studio. So you have a, a wonderful blue building at one end of the campus and a wonderful orange building at the other. Plenty of commentary here. It's rolling, tumbling out here, which is rather wonderful. But can I just say in wrapping, thank you so much for, for the erudite, the insight, and the, the, the sheer wonder of sharing some of your, your uh, thoughts on drawing. Uh, and for M in Tenerife, for Francis across in New York, and for Ian uh, over in the other side of, of Dorset, thank you so much for the time you set aside. And Anita in Dundee, thank you and everyone who joined in this conversation had some great plaudits over there. And uh, we will see you all again. And I imagine we will pick up some of the requests and some of the conversation on your website, Anita. Uh, but thank you again, everybody. Have a safe 
evening and a safe journey if you're moving on from this um from this wonderful gathering today all right that's it bye bye thank you very much bye bye, bye thank you bye thank you